Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to Teach Me to Talk's podcast. Today we're going to be discussing how we treat childhood apraxia of speech in toddlers and preschoolers. Now we have to still say suspected childhood apraxia of speech, and if you didn't join me for the last show, 431, go back and listen to that because there are some very big problems when we try to officially diagnose uh, children under three with apraxia, however, uh, beyond getting the diagnosis, the most important thing that we should be looking for is what we do about it. What are our treatment strategies? How do we provide intervention so that we can move this child along speech-wise so that he can begin to acquire language? And so again, that we can put him on the road to just being uh, the most functional communicator that he can be. But again, today we're gonna be just really focusing on that treatment piece. So if you wanna get that assessment information, go back and listen or watch uh, show 431. So we're gonna pick up today sort of with where we left off last time and I gave you a little preview of the four big areas that we're gonna be talking about when we're designing these initial treatment plans for uh, toddlers and preschoolers or really young children, two, three, and say four, particularly four if they haven't been diagnosed yet and haven't had a lot of inter intervention and they're still not really talking. And we do know that there are children that that happens to, even in the United States, where we have such a complex system for identifying children, there's still children that show up in kindergarten who've had very little, if any, services at all. And uh, our, our colleagues who work in preschool programs and kindergarten programs and in those early elementary age programs still see these kids when they have uh, not seen us in early intervention. So today's show is going to be more technical, specifically directed to speech language pathologists who work in those with those populations and in those settings that I just described in early intervention programs, in private programs or private clinics private practices where we see a lot of preschool children and even in uh, school systems with uh, preschoolers and those are, uh, again, maybe kindergarten age kids. Parents can also benefit from this information too, but the next show is where we're really, really, really gonna talk about strategies that are specific to parents. So if you are a therapist and even not an SLP, maybe you're a developmental therapist and you were just really thinking about apraxia and you're wondering if some children on your current caseload or maybe in the past have had that and so you want some additional information. And so uh, you'll benefit from this too, but the next show is really, really, really where you also are gonna get uh, the majority of the information that you would share with parents. All right, so let's start by looking at our handout. Now you can get our handout at uh, Teach Me to Talk, my website. The post is linked right here below on YouTube if you are watching on YouTube. And the handout is so great for these shows because you can walk through there and really remember this information. And it's particularly good for sharing this information with other team members and for with parents. So you can certainly pick that up. And if you are a parent and you think, I just don't even want, I don't care about this continuing education uh, credit that she's offering with this, but I just wanna be able to support Teach Me to Talk and the work that uh, you're doing there, you can certainly uh, purchase the handout and that helps us so much and it also benefits you as well because you'll get to keep that information and again refer to it over and over. So let's start with where we left off last time by just looking at the general treatment recommendations uh, that we're going to be talking about and these are four big things that we have to think about as pediatric SLPs when we suspect apraxia as the reason that a child isn't communicating. And remember we talked about last time, sometimes apraxia can be a part of a child's problem. There are other developmental issues going on but apraxia is a diagnosis that best explains what's going on with his or her communication development or lack thereof <laughs> for the speech piece. But it can also be uh, just a standalone diagnosis. And so let me just say that the strategies that we're gonna talk about today are beneficial regardless of where a child stands with that. But this first point with prioritized language is particularly important for children who are missing some other uh, significant parts of communication function. And we're gonna talk about that specifically as related to pre-linguistic skills. So we're gonna, I'm gonna give you 11 things to look for so that you can make sure that you are uh, addressing all of a child's communication needs and so that we aren't just looking at that talking piece, that we're making sure that he has all those prerequisite skills or all those pre-linguistic skills that we need that child to master before he's really, really, really going to be able to communicate. The second part of that 
is focusing on communication and not just talking. So for some children with apraxia, we need to get another system of communication going. So our second big piece here might be, most likely will be, to introduce some kind of AAC system. Now, if you're not familiar with that terminology, it's alternative augmentative communication. Or I always say it backwards, it might be augmentative first, but AAC, meaning something in addition to supplement a child's verbal skill. So it could be signs, it could be pictures, or it could be a speech generating device. And those are usually the kinds of things that we introduce first to very young children. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of each of those systems and talk about how we select a system based on a child's specific strengths and weaknesses and a family's preferences because that's so, so important. The third piece that we're going to talk about when we are designing these initial treatment plans for toddlers and preschoolers is emphasizing the mode treatment principles. Now these are going to be the things extraneous of the language principles that we're going to talk about, but this is what really makes apraxia therapy work or not work for kids. And so many of the things that we're going to talk about, the three big principles, mass practice, cues, and shaping. Not in that order, we're really going to go shaping cues and mass practice, but if you don't have those three components for a kid with apraxia, that may be why he or she is not making enough progress or why they tend to make progress and then they plateau and you can't ever really get a handle on what's happening. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's the approaches that we're using. We're not systematic enough. We're not intentional enough. We might be using our language facilitation strategies and then wondering why they're not working. So we have to add this motor piece. And let me just say, it would be better for you as a pediatric therapist to overdo the the uh, the motor piece with everybody because even with the language kids they're just straight language there are no motor planning issues um, not even really phonological issues going on with speech intelligibility they're just late talkers even those kids benefit more from the addition of these motor treatment principles and we'll make even better progress. That's how important I think these kinds of strategies are. And so if you're not using these kinds of things, I certainly hope that after today, after this course, that you will be. And then the last piece that we're gonna talk about are the linguistic approaches. And again, you might think about linguistic approach. You may be thinking about that more in terms of language, but let's think about it even more in terms of, say, phonological development. And you'll know that Dr. Barbara Hodson is who's done the cycles approach that's so popular with toddlers and preschoolers because it really uh, facilitates the emergence of a new pattern rather than always trying to focus on this is an error, I've got to fix it, fix it, fix it. We certainly do that with kids with apraxia. However, because we're talking about new talkers in this earliest phase of speech therapy, we don't need to get so carried away with making sure that everything is completely accurate. We still need to be facilitating the language part still, and, and just like we do uh, the speech part. That's what we're really gonna talk about with these linguistic patterns, these phonological patterns. Which ones affect intelligibility most? So these are the ones that we need to pay attention to uh, with our youngest clients. So we're gonna take a look at all four of these things, really break it down, and again, look at those specifics. But before we do that, <clears throat> I wanna begin with a study about parent perceptions and adaptations to their child getting a diagnosis like apraxia. Now this is a wonderful study that you can find at the website apraxia-kids.org. If you've never been there, it's certainly worth your time because so they have just a wealth of information. It's an older website, so it's like mine. They've got you know over 10 years, 15 years of information there. And so if you're a therapist and you haven't been there in a while, or if you suspect that one of your clients uh, we'll get an apraxia diagnosis and a parent is really wanting more information. It is a fabulous website. So uh, let's talk about the study that I found there. And this is so important for us as professionals because it really sets the stage for everything we do and making sure that we get started on the right foot with a parent and that we're not uh, just really, again, not considering all the things that we need to consider when we are planning treatment for a child. And so I wanted to start with this. And so the very first thing to come out of this study was, and I'm gonna read it because I think it's, it's so impactful the way that it's written here. The first is that professionals must recognize that for the most part, parents viewed their interactions with the medical and educational communities as, get ready, disheartening, 
unhelpful, and at times adversarial. And so that just maybe gives you a gut punch like it does me because I don't want anybody that I've ever worked with professionally to feel that way about me and that their interactions weren't positive and that they didn't feel uh, supported. And so that's what this study really, really said. And it was a small number of parents that they looked at, but I think it really is reflective of the kinds of things that I hear and have heard since 2008 at Teach Me to Talk with parents who are coming and saying, hey, this school system, I'm not getting the services I need. Or the therapist that I saw or the team of therapists, it just did not feel positive to me at all. And the thing to come out of this study was for us to realize just the negativity and you know parents are so caught up in and not only getting the right amount of services for their child and making sure that they can do everything humanly possible to address a, a language to address talking in their sweet baby that they certainly did not anticipate would have these kinds of needs and so they're dealing with that with making sure they get services and the big emotional component Will my child ever be normal? How's he gonna do in school? Is he ever gonna get to grow up and go to college and have a job and have a family? These are the really important real life things that parents think about. And so when they encounter negativity at the very beginning, then they have to kind of claw through all of that too. And so we have to really realize that even despite sometimes our very best intentions, parents are just dealing with so much negativity at the beginning. So we have to know that, that they may be starting with you in a, in a place that's really, really negative. Uh, let me say one other thing about this, that they talked about just that the general feeling about the medical communities and educational communities, especially school systems. Do you know the one program overall that parents had so much, uh, had, had a lot of positive things to say about, and it was really kind of comparative once their child got older, they looked back with fondness <laughs> with their birth to three people, with their early intervention teams. And why was that? Because we focus on treating the kids as a part of their entire families. And we look at this as this is mom and dad. These are, we're working with mom and dad, not just the child. And so I loved that. And if you are an early intervention therapist, like I've been forever and you, you're working currently in a state early intervention program, or if your private practice is focused on toddlers, you're a part of this. And so we need to realize that the way that we're doing this, the way we're providing services for children really focused on mom and dad and what their needs are and what they want to see their child accomplish. That's what we can do to really utilize that family-oriented approach that makes things so much more positive for that family. All right, the second recommendation to come out of that study was that even one, one, uno, one, a singular positive experience with one professional can make all the difference in helping a parent really, really adapt. And then that results in healthy adjustment as they move through these initial treatment phases with their child. So even if you feel like, oh my goodness, I'm working in this system that I don't even think is doing a good enough job to serve kids and families, just you, just you being there deciding, hey, I'm gonna be the positive person. I'm gonna be that one positive encounter <laughs> that parents have. And so just making that decision from the get-go, I think we can really capitalize on that and really know that, that, hey, I can get this family started on the right foot if I am just as positive and as professional and as caring and as competent as I can be in helping parents uh, deal with that. One more thing about parents, and then we're going to move straight to uh, talking about those four overall treatment recommendations. Uh, parent participation is just key. It's key for every kid in early intervention, and again, we really, really know that because of how our programs are structured to really focus on parents. But here, with apraxia, with a kid with a motor speech problem, unless parents are really, really uh, practicing with that child at home and they are really, really participating in therapy, not just that you know, couple of times a week or one hour or whatever that child happens to get. We're gonna talk about frequency later too. Unless parents are really, really participating, you are not going to see good progress with that child. Now I talk about all the time with late talking children and with <clears throat> even kids with autism. You know, I'm really clear to say, hey, I've had, I've had families that kids have made okay progress when I know 
the parents didn't hardly did anything that I suggested, so it can happen, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. With apraxia, you have got to have parents on board and you have got to have them practicing with them because again, the, the part that drives motor speech development is repetition and do it saying once they get a word, helping them master that word. And that, the only way you can do it is just with practice, 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 repetition, 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 shaping, 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 cues, cues, cues. You've got to have all that. And so from the beginning with your parents, when you suspect apraxia, you have got to really share with them how important it is uh, for them to participate. All right, so let's start with this first big thing and break all of this down. So let's talk about prioritizing language. What does this mean? This means that we want a child uh, using all of the other components of language Talking is just one piece, that verbal piece, but all these other things that have to go into helping a child be able to communicate. And again, we want to always prioritize communication and language over talking. So how do we do that? Well, we start with toddlers and young preschoolers, <coughs> pardon me, by making sure that they have mastered all these other things that come first. Now, I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, pre-linguistic skills, and I've done podcast series about it and written a whole uh, book that's over 300 pages, so it's something that I'm totally passionate about. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to run through what these 11 things are. Now, as a therapist, I want you thinking about the children on your caseload, and I want you thinking about the kids that you are thinking about have that suspected childhood apraxia of speech diagnosis and I want you thinking about those kids with these pre-linguistic skills because before you work on the talking piece or the apraxia piece the speech piece you've got to address these things first and this is particularly important when there's another diagnosis beyond apraxia and remember in our last show we talked about that one study said that 63 percent of all kids with autism also have apraxia so we're going to see apraxia not as the standalone diagnosis more often than not it's going to be part of something else and so we need to think about that and we need to think about okay before i can get to apraxia or that talking piece what are the other things that I need to be looking at? And so let's run through this here. And uh, I, don't, I didn't bring that book over with me to hold it up and show you how you can get more information about pre-linguistic skills, but the book is called Let's Talk About Talking. And the 11 skills here that we talk about in that book, let's run through this right now. Now, if you're a parent, think about your own child. And I want you to be really careful about this because we can screw this up. A lot of times we think, oh, he's got that. Oh, she's mastered that. And then months later, we realize, oh, if I had just focused focused on this first, if I had started with where my child's skills were emerging or things that were sort of coming in and I didn't pay enough attention to that, I just I just blew by it and went straight to talking. You can't do that. <laughs> that will seriously, seriously delay a child's progress. And so many times we're thinking about apraxia or we're thinking about something that sounds more technical when we should really be worried about more basic parts of communication. So let's run through these 11 things. Number one is reacts to events in the environment. So kids who really do their own thing and don't really notice other things or kids who have a really significant sensory issue, and I don't mean sensory like we talk about with kids that are busy or anything, I mean sens sensory issues like hearing and seeing. So our kids who have visual impairments or our kids who have hearing impairments or another big kind of neurological diagnosis, these might be the kids who have difficulty responding to events in the environment, but we have kids have to be able to do that before they're ready to communicate. The second part is responding to people. So these, we want children to be happily engaged and pleasantly participating with the adults in their lives. So with their parents, we want them looking at them, making eye contact. We want that a joint attention piece, which we're gonna talk about specifically, but we want that emerging just with enjoying being uh, with other people and consistently responding to other people. When kids aren't doing that, we know that that's a red flag for autism. So we certainly wanna be sure that we've got that reciprocity, that back and forth, communication piece going. So we want to see kids light up when we play with them and we want them to stay with us. The second, the third skill here is turn taking. We want them again to have that nice reciprocity, taking turns with us when we play. Not just necessarily in a board game, that comes a lot later, but doing things like when we're 
when we're playing with potato heads that we each are putting uh, the you know pieces in the potato head that we're sharing that experience together with turn taking that a kid tries to give you a drink from his cup or he wants you to brush the hair with the uh, with the hairbrush that you're playing with so again or you to push the car or even with turn taking just to look at you and recognize that it's your turn to talk and so those are really really important things we don't want kids doing self-isolating remember we just talked about that with autism and it's the same thing here with turn taking the fourth skill is develops a longer attention span we cannot work on helping a child learn how to talk if he is constantly running away from us and is only has like a two second attention span. We're gonna need longer than that. So sometimes with our little guys with apraxia, that's the first thing we have to do is really work on getting them to learn how to participate with us and stay with us and play with us. And so that might be something that you're going to need to address before you even get to the talking piece. The fifth skill here is joint attention. And I talked about that with kids with autism. Joint attention means that a kid is looking, he's able to keep you and what you're both looking at in on his mind in in his in his little realm of attention so he's going to look at what you both are talking about like if we were talking about my pink cup here he would be looking at that and then looking back at you and looking at that and looking back at you and so you're all three paying attention to the same thing so that's joint attention when we don't have that kids miss language they don't understand they don't get to that this is called a cup <laughs> because they're not uh, listening or attending and, and and it's not a choice so many times uh, this is just their little systems just aren't mature enough to do that but we have to have them focused on that and so that joint attention piece so that they can assign meaning to those words and so when we're missing joint attention language is just going to be really really hard for that child to acquire. So we have to get there. Skill number six, plays with a variety of toys appropriately. That's not just so that his play skills can be great. It's because that's how we assess and how we uh, progress with cognition. So kids have to learn everything they do verbally, non-verbally first. So when a kid is learning uh, labels for things, again, or that might not be the best example, but when a kid is learning how to uh, join ideas so that he can join words for phrases, he has to do that non-verbally first with toys. And so uh, also when kids are not becoming symbolic, when they are staying just stuck in constructive play or exploratory play and they don't move on to pretend play, they're not ready to be symbolic. And why is that important? Because words are symbolic. We were using the example before, this isn't really a cup, it's just what we call it. It's just the label for it. And so we, we again learn that through play, not necessarily that word, but that things represent other things. So kids pretend that their little fist is a cup or they pretend that a stick is a spoon. And so they learn to use symbols, use one, one something to represent another something. And so that's what words are. And again, we see that through play. So when kids aren't learning those basic cognitive concepts like uh, object permanence, cause and effect, simple problem solving, they're going to have difficulty learning how to talk because from a cognitive perspective, they haven't mastered those milestones. They, they're not thinking or planning or remembering or learning like other kids their age. And so play is a really, really important part, way to assess that and again, to drive that cognitive process. The seventh skill, uh, is understands words in early uh, simple directions. And so again, that's receptive language. Kids can't use words until they understand words. And so if you have a child on your caseload that you're suspecting apraxia with and he's not following directions, that's what you ought to be working on. And as a parent, I hope you heard me say that because it's the same for you too. If you're worried about your child not talking yet, but he's not really following directions, you gotta back up and work on that piece first. The eighth skill is really, really uh, common sense. It's vocalizes purposefully. So if you have a kid who doesn't understand that he can control his voice, that he can make it loud and soft, that he can talk, he, it's, it's completely volitional. He can do it on his part. And lots of our kids with apraxia don't vocalize. Uh, where they are, uh, again, being intentional about it. Every, every time they make a noise, it's reflexive, meaning that their body just did it. They didn't understand that they were supposed to talk. And so we have to get kids where they understand how to control their voices and how to vocalize purposefully. The next one is imitation. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about imitation. It's so hard, verbal and oral imitation can be so hard for our little guys with apraxia. And so that's certainly something that we're gonna have to think about how teaching them how to imitate before we even get to the words piece. 
Skill number 10 uses early gestures, sometimes with our little guys with apraxia, with motor planning. They also don't only have difficulty motor planning for their mouths, they have difficulty motor planning with their hands, and so sometimes they're not using a lot of gestures. And so, again, this would be when apraxia is just part of a child, or verbal apraxia is part of a child's overall problem. And that issue with motor planning is also going to affect how he uses his uh, hands, or even maybe if it's a real global thing, even his legs. His, uh, and so we have to really think about that too with their motor skills, how it could be uh, gross motor uh, issues that would be involved. And then the last prelinguistic skill is uh, making sure that a child can initiate interaction. So we want children knowing that they can take the first step. They can get someone's attention. They can, they can make requests, uh, when, and that's part of learning how to communicate. And so those 11 things have to be firmly in place. And it doesn't matter if a child has apraxia or not. A kid who has not mastered those prelinguistic skills is not developmentally ready to learn how to talk and communicate. And so we have to get those things going first. Now, I have a podcast cast about that is uh, show number 385 to walk you through those 11 skills and then I have a, a whole series of 11 shows after that 386 through what would that be 397 those that's a whole set of shows podcast for absolutely free <laughs> to tell you how to address those prelinguistic skills and if you want the the therapy manual that does that that's less talk about talking and there's a shorter version of a video on YouTube on our YouTube channel that teach me to talk uh, that says is my child developmentally ready to talk and it'll walk through those prelinguistic skills so if you have not done that and that's something that you're realizing as a parent or a therapist today about a child that you suspect to practice with get that information and that's where you're going to start with that kid and we've got to prioritize those skills over everything because again they're not going to make tons of uh, progress until those pieces are in first. It's not just the talking piece for those kids. We've got to get the other pieces established too. All right, so let's move on to that next piece of the treatment plan, and this is to get AAC going. Now, some parents really balk at this, and they think that if we introduce signs or if we give a kid some pictures to use or some kind of uh, device, that that means that he's just going to get so lazy and he's never going to want to talk, and we are preventing him from talking and that is just not true. <laughs> but I hear it over and over and over. I mean, I even hear it in my casual everyday life when I just meet somebody. And I'm a grandmother, I'm grandmother age now. I have a uh, grandchild and sometimes another grandmother will say, you know, oh, I know what you do because my grandchildren, my grandchild has apraxia or, uh, you know, my grandchild's in speech therapy or something. And, and we'll start talking about something and one of the first things that a lot of grandparents will say to me is, you know, they wanted to teach him how to sign and I just told my daughter, no, don't do that. That's going to make him not be able to talk. And we have to address that, not only with the parents that we see, but we need to make sure that parents are addressing that too and sharing that AAC does the opposite of that. It actually reduces frustration in a child. It actually increases their communication success. So they get excited about communicating and sometimes it's just that extra little bump that puts them over the edge and you barely even get AAC started before that kid is really making tons of progress and you know that oh, he's going to be a talker and even if we're using the system supplementally mom and dad relax a little bit and it sort of takes the pressure off because we know oh he's going to talk and the system again is just a bridge and I'll tell you the truth with AAC, sometimes I have felt like that's the reason kids have made progress and the reason that they've gotten better because we've increased their motor planning, particularly when we introduce the first kind of AAC, which is using sign language. And what is sign language? It's just pairing motor movements with a word so that you understand what the kid is trying to communicate even if he can't talk yet. And so sometimes, again, parents get wigged out about that. They think it's uh, only kids with hearing loss would use sign language. And so you really have to do a lot of educating. I like using signs and gestures at the very beginning of a treatment, again, to get communication going because it's more word-like. Kids have to do something different. They have to use a different body movement just like they would with their little mouths, a different mouth shape, uh, like they would use a different hand shape for a word. And so that's another reason that I like gestures in sign language so much. But the cons, the why can't some kids use signs? We already talked about sometimes it 
parent's parent preference that they don't understand it. Now, I found that most of the time, if we really say to a parent, listen, I do not want you to be worried about that. I have taught hundreds of kids how to sign, and guess what? They all went on to talking. I, I have not had one client stay at signs. Now, we may have moved on to, you know, another system. We know that he's he's so, he can't communicate everything that he needs to communicate with this little system. You know, so we're going to bump that up. But I've never just had a kid just strictly stay there. I never have. And so when I share that with parents, and, and I'm not saying every kid's going to talk. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there will be things to move on to. And so talk with parents about that and really help them, again, get on board. Um, the other thing, the other con with signs is that sometimes kids with apraxia, their motor planning is so bad, their, their signing attempts are off target. I've had kids, again, that, and you wonder if it's a cognitive thing, too, in addition to the motor planning piece. But you'll try to teach more here, and they're just they're doing it everywhere except on their hands. Now, I'm not talking about kids that modify it. A ton of kids will use a finger to their hand for more. Is that a motor planning issue? Eh, you know, we know that the sign for more looks like this. You know, I'm not really going to say, I, I don't care. Let me just say it this way. I'm glad they're doing something with their hands, and that I can recognize it as a sign for more. But again, sometimes we'll see that motor planning also be effective for signs and so for those kids who either because it's the motor the motor planning is so hard for them that it makes it harder to sign then you're not going to do that you're going to move on to one of these other systems but i've had other kids uh, and i've told this story a lot a child that i kept trying to teach him how to sign please how to sign please and he he was a set he was one of a set of triplets and so many things going on with that that those little those little boys but i mean he would try to sign please on his back he would do everything but sign it right here and so it just got to the point that signs just were not productive because we were always going what's that what 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 is he trying to do and again we love the effort but you may for some of those kids have to move on to something else so picture exchange communication system is the uh, is a wonderful uh, method of aac for for kids of all ages but particularly for our youngest little clients because we're just teaching them to look at a picture and then to give that picture uh, to an adult so that they are making requests or whatever language function they're using it for and certainly we start with the request but but it, it's so great and PEX really teaches intentionality so for our little guys who are not initiating or for our little guys who don't know how to respond that are always just kind of deer in the headlights or the ones who are just always so frustrated because nobody understands what they need PECS is a wonderful system to get it going. There are no prerequisites for PECS other than you need two adults and you need to be willing to practice a lot. Now the picture exchange communication system is different than using a core vocabulary book or another kind of maybe just a little page of pictures that some therapists might do with kids with apraxia and that is fine. You can certainly do that and if, and if a child is advanced enough to look at a set of 10 pictures and point to the one he wants with definity and, and you know it and he knows it and it's perfect purposeful, go for it. But for most of our little guys that are in early intervention, the picture exchange communication system is the best way to teach how to use pictures to communicate because the, the practice and the structure is built in and kids learn it from the get-go and you're not making a ton of mistakes. And so go back and uh, I'll link the show where we introduce uh, AAC to get communication going. I'll link that there so you can get some more information about signs, pecs, and speech generating devices. But know what the cons with this, you have to keep up with the cards and the parents have to be willing to practice. And uh, research says you have to get 30 trials a day to even be effective. So if you have a set of parents that uh, they're just not going to do it for whatever reason. Maybe they're saying, hey, just not interested in pictures. Don't don't waste your time on that because they're not going to be able to uh, practice enough for their child to be successful. And so uh, that certainly is a con for that. The last kind of uh, AAC is a speech generating device. Now you can use something as simple as a Big Mac switch where you are putting different pictures on there and then you're programming the switch. You're, it's like a battery operated switch so that you say what you want the device to say and when the child touches it, the device says the message. That's good because kids can hear that model of simplified speech. It encourages imitation. We've got some motor imitation going there too. But the con is the same thing with the pictures. You have to keep up with the device. A parent has to be willing to reprogram it a lot. Even if you get like a more complex system where a kid can have levels of different things to say, 
You still have to have an adult to do that. Uh, but, but for some kids, a speech generating device is the way to go because they may have some motor issues too. They may have some visual issues so that they can't scan a page and look at their pictures. And so these are all really simplistic ways to get communication going at the beginning. Now, I've got the show number now on my notes. It's show 410. And so if you need some help getting started with AAC with toddlers, that's going to be the show that you need to watch to, to really, uh, now you know what to do, but that show is going to teach you how to do it. Now, uh, before we go on, again, I just want to say how grateful that I am that you are here. And if you feel that you've benefited from these videos, please consider purchasing the PDF so that we can continue to make the videos uh, for parents who can't afford that. All right, so now we've talked about the first two pieces. We talked about prioritizing language, and then we talked about getting AAC going, and now we're up to talking. We're to what I, we really, really, really want to talk about for the remainder of this show. And I feel like when I'm working with a toddler who, again, may not even go on to get an official diagnosis of apraxia, but when I'm just seeing these little motor things that they can't do, when I'm seeing that they're play, that they're not great with, like, uh, with, with, with toys sometimes unless we're really just showing them how to play with a toy and so we realize with these kids gosh it's imitation imitation is the skill that they are really really missing now I've just taught a whole podcast series on this with eight shows so show 421 to 429 but I'm going to give you the 10 minute version of this as we run through this and so this is my my number one go-to when I'm working with toddlers, and this is what I started to say, sometimes we can get, uh, and this might be a little controversial to say, but I'm gonna say it anyway. When we can get imitation going, and when we can get that motor planning piece, get that little pump so primed, I think we help a lot of toddlers avoid uh, an apraxia diagnosis or avoid a more serious speech language problem because we get these things going so early. Now, do I have a specific study to back that up? A lot of studies back it up. A lot of studies say that early intervention works because of neuroplasticity and because, again, for specifically for children with apraxia because we are establishing new motor neural pathways. And so, that again, that's why I think this is so important to really as speech language pathologists, don't just think about imitation in terms of, or motor planning in terms of oral motor planning or verbal motor planning. We need to look at a child globally for imitation. And again, I really believe that this is how we get, how so many of our little guys make so much progress in early intervention because we're, we're working at these global issues, not just imitating to talk, but imitation in general. And so we walk through this level of imitation. We can't just all, get all the way up to words. That's actually at level seven. And this information is from my book, Building Verbal Imitation in Toddlers. And I'll just show you this chart real quick. Kids don't learn how to imitate, even typically developing kids right up here at words at the beginning. If you're if you're talking about a child learning how to imitate, you know, and you may think, oh, well, that comes in at about the time they turn one to learn how to imitate. No way. It starts much earlier than that, where they first learn how to imitate gestures. And uh, newborns actually will imitate a lot of nonverbal movements with their face and mouth. That's going to be harder for late talkers, so we sort of save that for later, we do the easiest kind of imitation first, which is motor imitation and teaching actions with objects. So if you have a kid on your caseload that you suspect apraxia and you don't know where to start and you think, I'm just going to start at the beginning, look at their motor imitation. How well can they copy you? when you uh, perform an action with an object. So that would be like using a toy or using an object in everyday activities. So look at that. And then we walk them up to imitating body movements. Now, for lots of our little guys with apraxia, this is where we start because we're gonna do what we just said in overall uh, treatment recommendation two with getting communication going. We're gonna look at AAC and so we're gonna get signs going. And so that's where they start to imitate those body movements, which again, uh, gets them ready to talk. And I haven't said this in this show, but I'll just go ahead and say it. Gestures predict the emergence of words. And so until we see a child doing a lot of gestures and until they're able to copy a lot of gestures, they're not even able to do it spontaneously. So when we keep walking it back and walking it back and walking it back, teaching body movements and teaching imitation uh, at that level is going to be very, very, very beneficial for a child because we are filling in that, those foundational pieces and really teaching him how to learn. I watch what other people do and then I do it. 
I hear what other people say and then I say it. And so that's that's what we want to be sure that we're we're really, really focused on uh, with our youngest clients. Now here with teaching gestures or teaching signs, some of our little guys with apraxia are already beyond this because they have learned and they know on some level, I cannot talk <laughs> and I've got to make my mom and dad understand what I want. And so they develop a lot of compensatory gestures or compensatory little movements. So, you know, and I've gone into homes and I've worked with parents and a, a kid will just start doing, you know, some little, thing that maybe looks to me like I have no idea what that is. I don't want to say looks weird, but I'm always, you know, looking for intentionality so it doesn't look weird to me, but I can see how a kid would, you know, just like do something like this and mom says, oh, he wants a popsicle. And you go, okay, I never would have gotten that, but mom knows because that's his little sign. He's, I guess he's licking it like he, you know, would lick his little popsicle or whatever he's done for that. He's done it. He's compensated. And so when we see a kid doing that, I think immediately, oh my goodness, he's so ready for science. And so we just get him going. I mean, and, and again, it's not like we have to quote unquote teach him how to imitate there. He's already, he already knows I need another way to talk here or another way to communicate. And so that's what we're going to do with those kinds of kids when they're already coming up with those little things. We know we go straight to science. And for our kids who are, who are not doing that sort of thing, it takes a little longer maybe to get those signs going uh, because they have to learn their prerequisites. They've got to learn, hey, th easier things like clapping or shaking my hands when you have them up in the air or stomping my feet. Or if you run across the room, I'm going to run across the room. And so for some kids, that's where we meet them. That's where we have to start with imitation. And so looking at these easy your earlier levels be before we get to talking are going to be what we need to focus on with those kinds of kids. Now, uh, again, for some guys, we don't have to stay here very long because, you know, for some kids I, 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 with apraxia, even as toddlers, I'm teaching them, you know, 10 new signs a session and they got it. I mean, they're using them right away and the parents have to go home and practice and they have to keep them meaningful, but they're within our session. They're just eating it up. I mean, they're ready. And so for those kids, again, meet them there, give them those tools, teach them how to do that, get that communication piece going. And for your kids who are not ready, that's what you're gonna work on. And again, I've given you some show numbers so you can go back and listen to those podcasts so uh, learn how to do that. But the other part of this would be then as we're moving toward words to get, then teach kids to do that next little level up. And these are gonna be sound effects kinds of things. And so we gotta get kids noisy before they can say words. And so if you're working with a little guy who you think has apraxia and he's not copying just any kind of little like a fake cough or a fake sneeze or things like raspberries or um, little sound effects when he's playing like animal sounds or playing with his cars and trucks start there because you know that because of the novelty and the motivation with those things that you're going to be able to get, teach a child how to imitate those kinds of things uh, first and so those play sounds and that show that's in that uh, I believe that that show number 424, and I'll link that below if you want some specific strategies to get that going. But you're just really going to, again, get a kid noisy, get him to say anything, get any of those little noises going, because he's got to learn, especially with apraxia, I have control of this, and I can make my voice and my mouth do different things, and so that's how we teach that. Now, if you can't get direct vocal imitation going, you may have to take a step back and this is particularly, again, harder for our little guys with apraxia. And so you're just going to have to work on that where you can do that. So let me teach you a trick. And I've, I've done a therapy tip of the week about this. And I'm going to post this below too. But this is where I call it the bucket trick. Or uh, you can use a big pot from your kitchen or a big bowl. But it's just getting those sounds going where, you are, where you're taking turns with that, where, where you're just leaning into that bucket or leaning into that pot and just vocalizing with some kind of vowel that you've heard that child to use or it might be a syllable but for a lot of times that we're going to talk about our little guys with apraxia we need to work on vowel differentiation and so just doing an uh or an ah or an ooh or an o oh, or an e or whatever vowel they can do into that and letting the child hear you do that and it's such a fun little game and then giving them the bowl or the pot so that they can do that too so that you're really teaching that intentionality and that they can copy you they can imitate what you've done now some kids again they're not going to be ready for that you're going to need to put all of this 
uh, imitation in the context of play. And if you'll go back and listen to that podcast series where I uh, show 425, where I'm walking you through how to do that with play sounds, uh, you've got to get it in play. It can't just be that where, you know, you're going to put the bowl in front of them and you're going to think, oh, this is it. He's going to talk. This is the magic trick. You're going to have to work it into the context of play again. Uh, so for a lot of these kids here with sound effects, this is where we're really going to find out so much information about their uh, repertoire and what sounds they have and what sounds they can do and what sounds they can't do. And so for me, I like to think about that here uh, with play sounds as well as we are uh, looking at, you know, uh, again, getting that real uh, specific phonemic repertoire so that I'm writing down all the consonants that he has and I'm writing down all the vowels that he has and I'm looking at that and I'm seeing, you know, as, at, you know, it is, is there a little sound in there? When he's playing with his cars, did, did I hear a k? Did I hear, mm? did I hear, you know, and you come up with, whatever those little sounds are that you've heard because then you're going to be able to pair those and make different words out of those. So that's certainly something that we're going to kind of hold on to. I want you to think about that. Now let's go back to play sounds too and think about something else. And this is where we're going to start really talking about our uh, motor speech concepts, those concepts that we talked about that what we're going to emphasize that kids with apraxia have to have the motor treatment principles. And so here, you're not just thinking about the sounds, you're thinking about the movement and the fluidity or the child's ability to sequence those sounds. And so you're gonna, with these play sounds, this is where you're gonna start. You're gonna start to give a child really specific information about what he's doing with his mouth so that he learns that he can do it. So that when, you, and let's think about this. We'll talk about the cues later. Let's just talk about the movement piece first. So when we're teaching these little play sounds, we for a kid that we suspect has apraxia or a motor play, planning problem, we need to think about what is he doing movement-wise with his mouth. So with the pant, with a little play sound like a pant, do you know what I mean by that? Like the sound a dog makes. <laughs> okay, that's an easy early vocalization to get and it's a play sound and if, you, if you're not using that as your sound that a puppy makes or a dog makes in therapy, you need to change that today <laughs> because it'll make a big difference and it'll help you get a new phone phoneme with an H there, a new sound for a kid to do. Uh, but what do I think about when I'm, for a kid with apraxia, you know, am I thinking, you know, he's got an H, yes, but I'm also thinking, ha, 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 he's got an open mouth. Okay, I've got his mouth open. Okay, good. I've got a starting point. He's got his mouth open. And you're going to do that with every little play sound that you think. And so when you think about uh, with panting, okay, I've got that open mouth for that pant. Ha, ha, ha. I've got that sound there. What else can I do to make this just a little bit more complicated? We're thinking about the movement pace. You might add your tongue out so that you're painting like that. <laughs> That's going to be, you know, again, you've done, you, you've sequenced something there. You know, he's opened his mouth, he's got his tongue out. Might be for something like that pretend sneeze, you know, <laughs> and your kid with apraxia just might get <laughs> or something or, <laughs> or look for the movement. You want his mouth open and then you want a rounding of those lips for the ooh part. So, ah, Chew. Something that's really important that we'll talk about in the cueing piece is really exaggerating your mouth movements because you want a child with apraxia. Their problem is planning those motor movements. So they may know the word they want to say up here. They just, again, can't get it here because their mouths, again, that, that planning for uh, their mouths to do what you want them to do and not, you know, all the parts of their mouth as SLPs, we don't always say that to parents. You know, we're thinking about their lips and their tongue and their cheek muscles and their teeth, you know, for a sound like, th you know, we use your teeth. Uh, for a sound like F, th we use your teeth. So that's an articulator too. So, or the back of the throat with the pharyngeal sounds like K's and G's. And so, we're talking to parents, just to, it's that movement, it's that planning those movement pieces. And again, we talked about back in that uh, previous show in 431, it's not that the child has anything wrong, quote unquote, with his or her mouth because we don't see any motor issues per se. That would be dysarthria if we saw a lower muscle tone or cerebral palsy, a type of that with a higher muscle tone. That would be different when there are observable muscle tone differences. But with, remember, with apraxia, we don't see that. And so when you're talking to a parent about making sure that we, we've got to get these movement pieces going, how, we have to teach a child how to sequence movements with his mouth. That's the most important thing that you're going to say. So let's keep on going with our play sounds here. What about for a sound like, 
like a cow sound. What are the postures and what are the movements that we're going to emphasize with that? It's what? What sound does the cow make? Moo. So for that M, what do we do? We've got our lips are closed with that. And then we move to an open mouth posture. So then the rounded lips for OO. So can you see how that's completely different from a pant? With the pant, we started with the kid's mouth was open. Now we're starting with the, uh, the kid's mouth is closed. This is where we're going to see oral groping with our little guys. As they are learning how to imitate us, they're not going to st always start with the right posture for their mouth. So for a sound like a word like moo, they may start with their mouths open like they did for the pant. And again, that's called oral groping. Now, a lot of times when I first heard oral groping, I thought that meant that a kid was doing this, trying to find the right spot. You can see that, but a lot of times it's just that they start wrong. You are starting with the bilabial and they start with their mouths open. You Maybe they talk with their mouths closed all the time. I get that email all the time from, from therapists and from parents. My child is talking now, <laughs> but everything he says, his mouth is closed. And that's what the kid does. And so I always think about apraxia for those kinds of kids. They don't they don't plan to open their mouths. And so think about that as you as you walk through the little play sounds. You might be working on a play sound like hee 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 hee. And again, are you working on that to get an H and a long E? Absolutely, but you're also working on it because you want them to use a different movement with their mouths. You want their lips spread for that E. So see what you're getting there with some play sound practice. You're going to get errors. The child, again, you might see some groping. You're trying to get moo, but all he can say is ma. That's okay. You're still going to get lots and lots of information about that. So then you can do that with all of those little exclamatory words too. So words like wow. How did you start that? You started with the with your lips, with your W, and then you open, and then you're back to that little pucker. So think about that. Think about what you're seeing with the kid. Think about, oh, is he just doing what? You know, is, does he just have that first initial? Can he, is it just that he can just get that and that he can't sequence the next sound? And a lot of times that's why so many of our little guys with apraxia just stick to vowels or even, even they might do a, a single consonant to represent a whole word because they can't get to the next sound. It's the movement. And so that's what we're talking about here with making sure that we are emphasizing that. The next little piece of teaching verbal uh, uh, imitation would be verbal routines. And again, that's helping kids get automatic speech. That's in show 427 if you need those specific uh, techniques with how to do that. And remember the focus of this show is just to teach you what to do, not necessarily teach you how to do it. We're going to get to that. Uh, but the verbal routines would be next. So that would be kids filling in automatic speech. So when you say ready, set, they say what? Go. When you say one, two, what do they say? They say three. And so the reason verbal routines work so well for toddlers and preschoolers with apraxia is because, again, they're not really thinking about it. It's become more automatic to them. And we know they've kind of bypassed whatever, whatever part has made that hard for them. And so that fill in a blank strategy is fantastic and it can last for a long time. And you can even do it with carrier phrases with kids. This might be to the part point where you can start to say, the kid is looking at something he wants and you know that he wants it. And you can say, you can model it like he can say it or you can model it like you know as an adult you would probably do oh I see you want the and sometimes they can just pop out that little word because you've given them that running start but a lot of times they don't do that unless you've gotten that automatic speech going with the verbal routines and for a lot of our guys with the practice they're gonna need more work but <laughs> it's not quite that easy but I just want you to know that strategy you might have to work on those single words first but think about again that principle for verbal routines and how you can use that with um, getting a child again to be able to to say something for him that's been harder for him to say when he's because it's not as automatic. All right, so let's now when we're talking about imitation, now we're all the way up to words, and these are words that we're going to have children imitate directly after us. So for kids with apraxia, this is super super hard because a lot of times again they just have not developed that repertoire of sounds, and so you've got to start with what you have. So for kids with apraxia, if you think he only has two vowels and one consonant. Start there. <laughs> 
start there with your words. And so shaping is huge for kids with apraxia when we think about start there. What, what sound does he have? And can I turn that into a word? Can I, can I change it? Can I get him to change it just a little bit so it sounds more like a word? Or can I help him use meaning? Can I help him use that little sound that he's already saying? Can we shape it into a word the other way where people recognize it and where he can use it meaningfully? And again, for so many of our little guys, it's just turning that little voice on and getting that going where mom consistently recognizes, hey, that is a word. He is trying to say that. And so for some of our little guys, it's like that. But let's talk about the specifics here. So let's say that a, a, one of your little friends has a neutral vowel, that uh, or a grunt. So you're gonna need to give that meaning. And so again, he might be using it anytime he wants something, but you might shape that into what he says when he wants his mom to pick him up. Or if he, that's not enough motivation for him, it might be when he wants her to throw him up. You know, that might be how you get that first little meaningful word going where you know he can say uh, and you shape it. You shape it into the word up by using that little game. And again, you're not going to worry about that final P. And as an SLP, we know shaping technically means we move the word closer and closer and closer and closer to what it should sound like. And so, but for us as SLPs, we're not going to worry about the p on up yet. We're just going to be happy that he's using it intentionally. He uses it a lot. And we've shaped that little grunt into a word. So uh, for a kid who says, oh, oh can become oh, oh, for uh, oh, if he can't do it any other way, or it could become oh, for oh, no. And again, you add that facial expression and you add that intonation so that it becomes meaningful. Ooh, when you teach that ooh, you might use it for yucky or ooh, like that. Or, you know, it might be something pretty ooh. And so you can use these little sounds that, again, shape these things, not only with adding more sounds to make the word clearer, but shape it meaning-wise, shape it with intonation. Now, lots of our little guys with apraxia also struggle with intonation. And so you're going to have to get them over the hump. Uh, with that too. Now, I wish I could give you some more hard and fast rules about vocabulary selection for kids with apraxia, but really it just depends on what a kid can already do. And so you're going to take as many sounds and, and, and think about what words can I turn this into. But for me, I still use those language list that I've shared, particularly in show 428 that I just did about teaching toddlers to imitate words. Those language lists are a good place to start because kids a lot of times will start to try to say that word and even though they have errors, you're going to hear some new sounds. You're going to start to pick out, oh, his syllable shapes are this. He can do a consonant vowel or he can do a vowel consonant. He can't get a consonant at the beginning, but oh my goodness, I'm hearing, I'm hearing the consonant at the end. And that's what a, a lot of times kids with apraxia will do. Their errors will be so unusual or the things that they can do will be so unusual compared to the things that they can't do. They might have an R when they're two, but not have a P, a B, or an M. And so sometimes you have to really think about that. And so four considerations for vocabulary selection, consider their motivation. Do you need a core vocabulary list like uh, David Hammer talks about, like putting it together with a little book? Or, or can you just do it with signs? How can you get these things going? How can you, how, how can you, well, let me, let me work on teaching a kid how to say the most important words that he needs. You never do that without a list from families. You never do that. And again, this is what early intervention teaches us to do. You never do that without really going through a family's daily schedule and looking at a child's preferences. The same thing holds true for a kid with apraxia. We have to give them those high frequency words that they need to know how to say, and those are the things we need to work on. For other targets, consider complexity. Choose words that are fairly easy to say. You are not going to start with multisyllabic words with a kid with apraxia. The third consideration is consider their existing sounds and patterns, and we've talked about this a lot. So let me give you an example. This would be that if a kid has three words, let's say he has three words. His three words are uh-oh, mama, and no. So what do you know about that? What you, can you do? Well, let's look at from the sounds. Look at the sounds that he already has. That means that we're going to start with words that uh, begin with a, uh, with an M, and with an N. Because he's told us, hey, I can do those words when that sound is in the initial position. So you think, okay, we already talked about a uh for up. We talked about uh, maybe do uh-huh or uh-uh. For M, besides mama, what can we do? We can introduce moo, like we talked about for that cow sound. But we can also use really functional words like me and more and mine and milk. 
for in. He's got the word no. Let's try nose. Let's try night night. Let's try knee. And so again, this is sort of a pra uh, sort of a trial and error. And if you're an SLP, you can make this even uh, more likely that he'll be able to get it uh, to be able to produce that sound. If you pair placement, take a a consonant made at the front of the mouth and and put it with the vowel made at the front of the mouth. So co-articulation is so important. Now my book, Functional, Artic Functional Phonology, I've done the work for you with tons of word lists like that and really pairing, you know, these are the best target words for if a kid has an N sound. These are the best target words to get a, a P or a, even with vowels. These are the best consonants that you would pair to get this vowel. So think about um, how you can do that and think about as an SLP, and again, we don't have time to go through all the specifics on this show. We're going to do some of that in next show too. But but think about, I want to take what that kid already has, and then I want to be able uh, to expand that. Let me give you a few more pieces of information about target word selection for kids with apraxia. First syllable shapes, like we said, are usually vowels and consonant vowel. And so starting with words that begin with vowels are great. Now, there's a whole word class, and I don't know if, as an SLP, if you can think about this now, but prepositions, a lot of those early prepositions that we teach start with vowels, so in, out, on, off up and then down. But again, that vowel variability is there. So I teach that a lot, but not until kids have already established their core vocabulary first, their most important people, places, things to eat, things they like to do, foods. You got to get those things going first, but then that next little rung of vocabulary uh, would be looking at those uh, vowel sounds and uh, uh, Look, looking at that uh, and, and teaching those that way. And again, the, the, the best vowels to teach are going to be the ones, too, that you can do some shaping with at the beginning and even do some hand cues. So I've talked about this in previous shows, and I'll try to link the vowel show bef below where I teach those specific vowels. But teaching an ah, uh, you know, from an ah, uh, from a neutral, neutral vowel, you can drop your jaw and get an ah. Uh, so then you move to two vowels. You can open your mouth and round your lips and get an O. Oh. You can pucker and get that oo, and you can spread and get that e. So just from that neutral vowel, ah, uh, then you, you know you go to ah. Uh, that's five. That's five vowels you've gotten just by shaping a child's mouth. Now, we're going to talk about this in the Q section. You can do it with some hand movements, but a lot of times it's just you modeling that and the child imitating that. So same thing with consonants. We kind of look at this from a developmental model, and we think of the initial sounds that children should have, uh, they should have six to eight different consonant sounds by the time they're 24 months, and we pull them from these sounds, P, B, M, T, D, N, uh, K, G, H, and W. So that's a developmental model, and so as an SLP working with children with apraxia who are in this youngest developmental phase, those are the sounds that, we're, that we want to see, but again, sometimes already said, you might have a kid who has a later developing sound. He can say an L. I might have a kid who can say Lara, perfectly, an L and an R, worst name ever for a toddler speech pathologist, but at the same time, they're not saying, they might not be saying mama because they can't get the M, and that might be kind of an out there example. You may never have seen that sort of thing, but just the variability that we'll see with kids with apraxia, so just know you may not be able to follow that developmental model. If they have a good L, teach a lot of words with L. If they have a, an S, Teach a lot of words with S and don't get caught up at the beginning in, oh, I've got to fill in these little things first. Go with what they have. Use the sounds they have. And I do this a lot, like, like we talked about before, with uh-oh, mama, and no. For uh, especially mama and no, I would think, okay, he's got a good M. He's got an N. Those are nasals. Let me, you know, let me think about what other words that, you know, how about the word moon? How about other words where we've got that, the, the nasal sound there? Uh, if you have a kid with a P, you're probably automatically going to think about, well, I'm going to try to get words with B because they're made at the same place in the mouth. But also think about, uh, you know, M with that or W, the, you know, expand it just a little bit to move on uh, to uh, that next rung of things that might uh, be a little bit more difficult. Now, we talked about vowels, and then we talked about constant vowels, and I am not going to have time to run through the whole list of 
great consonant vowel words that we would start with with toddlers and preschoolers with apraxia, but you can find that in functional phonology. But again, you want to match it. You want to make it as easy as possible. So when you have a bilabial made at the front of your mouth, you're going to want to think about vowels at the front of your mouth too. Now, when, at, when kids are older, we do a lot of times of working with a lot of with nonsense words. That's harder with kids that are toddlers. I mean, we can have kids imitate nonsense words, but I'm such a language, language, language person that I want it to make sense. So I'm really going to only use target words that are real words. So instead of, you know, running through like we used to do with traditional Van Riper articulation methods where we take, let's say we take uh, the word, take a B and we're going to, you know, run it through all the vowels. Some of those, you know, B, B-E-E -E is a word that makes sense, you know, with a front vowel there, but all of those front vowels may not make sense. And so a bay, bay is good if he's going to say baby or bay like the water out there in the bay, but that's not a word that a toddler would use all the time. So I try to stick to real words that are going to be super, super functional. All right. So let's quickly, quickly review what these principles for motor learning are. And this is such important information. I think what we're going to do is I'm just going to tell you this just super quickly and then we're going to bump this on into the next show because it's super, super important. But we talked about shaping, we talked about cues, and we talked about mass practice. And those are things that as an SLP or as any therapist who's going to work on communication, you're going to want to you're going to want to think about that constantly. How can I shape this word? How can I cue this word? What are the most important cues for me to use for this child? What are what what cues work for this kid? Does he have to see a visual cue or can he get it from just a verbal cue? Does it have to be a direct model of that sound or can I just model it in this word and he's going to be able to pick it up? You have got to be so on your game when you were treating toddlers and preschoolers with apraxia. It's not just like a language kit. I mean, you've got to really, really think about this from a theoretical perspective, what you're going to pair. And again, this, I, I'm, I cannot wait to teach you this next section of information because if you're not using the way to cue consonant sound production, you may it may be so hard for you to get a kid at, at this young of an age to, to learn a new sound or to acquire a new sound. And so those cues are going to be super, super important. And then the last concept that I want to leave you with today is mass practice. And so between now and the next show, for your kids with apraxia, I want you to think about mass practice. I, and what does that mean? It means that you're going to get them to say the same target word over and over and over and over and over. And why is that? Remember, we said that we have to establish a new neural pathway, a new motor plan. And so a kid with apraxia, that's why they lose words. That's why you might be able to get them to say a word in a session with you, and then mom doesn't hear it for weeks because the kid didn't own it. He didn't, you didn't, and I'm not blaming it on you. I'm not saying you didn't practice enough, but you know what it is? You didn't practice enough. <laughs> and so I guess I am blaming it on you. You didn't practice it enough for his little system to really have retained that motor pathway. And so that's the, that's the better way to say it. And so you've got to do that. And so cue, shaping, cues, and uh, mass practice, those are the three techniques that we are really, really going to talk about next time. And they are the techniques that can make or break you as a pediatric therapist uh, working with children with apraxia. So that's where we're going to pick up in show 432. Thank you so much for joining me for today's show. If you want to go ahead and get your hands on some of this great material to help you plan treatment better, whether you are a therapist or a parent, I've got two great tools for you. This first one is functional phonology, and it's the one that I mentioned with all those specific word lists, so that uh, when I was talking about co-articulation and pairing, uh, if you're a parent, again, you may just, you probably have already turned off the video, but if you're a therapist, you know, pairing consonants made, where they're made in the mouth with the vowels, and, do, and what words of those are appropriate for a toddler or preschooler who's a late talker who doesn't have a big vocabulary. I've done that work for you. So it's in functional phonology. And then the first book that I mentioned when we were walking through that imitation protocol is uh, building verbal imitation skills in toddlers. And that's what I did that whole show, a whole series of shows about, 421 to 429. And it's really building imitation from the ground up. And if you don't hear anything else from me for this, from this course, I want you to keep this. 
You have got to teach toddlers with apraxia to imitate before you teach them anything else. And so that's just what I want to leave you with today. And we're going to pick back up here in the next show. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and you've just participated in Teach Me to Talk's podcast. <laughs>